and a four nucleons and then a four nucleon. And I'll stop there because if we're doing a real scientific experiment and a measurement, we would, you know, have a lot of these, billions and billions of them. So what is the average number of nucleons? Well, let me grab my calculator for this. And it looks like I have one, two, three, four, five fours. So five times four is 20. Um, and then this is a 13. So the total here is 33. And if I take 33 and I divide it by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, I get an average of 4.125. And so, as a scientist, I would say, let's write down the average number of nucleons in that periodic table. Did you notice it's a little more than four? And that's why that number, 4.003, comes out the way it, it does. It's not exactly four. And so, there is this labeling here which is telling us the average number of nucleons. But that's why we round it to the nearest integer because if we're looking for the normal one, most of them as you see have a four. So if you round to the nearest integer, that's going to tell you the number of, of nucleons here. Um, by the way, as we keep going here, we will learn that when you go to get the weights of these atoms, the neutrons and the protons have about the same weight and the, that weight is way bigger than the weight of the electrons. And so really you could describe the weight of this atom by really the number of nucleons. You can ignore the electrons and you don't have to distinguish between the proton and the neutron when you're talking about the weight. Which is why I bet most of you, before you came to class today, have been told that this number, this 4.003, is its atomic mass or its atomic weight. And that's true, it is. So I, I'm not telling you anything new, but I am giving it from a different approach. And so I like to say this, this, this number right here, this 4.003, actually has three interpretations. The, the first one, before you came to class, probably back in middle school or high school, you called it its an atomic mass number. And, and that's true. Uh, I bet it even says right here, see? You look at the chart here, it says, what is that number? It's its atomic weight. And again, that is true, we'll, we'll show that. But I think also a better description of that is not to say it's its atomic weight, although that's true. It is also its nucleon number. It is telling you how many nucleons there is. Now, I said there were three ways to interpret that number. And so I'm trying to show you maybe the one you haven't been exposed to, which is its nucleon number. But its atomic weight, you could actually think of in two different ways. That's why I'm saying three. Uh, you could either say, this is the atomic weight of one atom in atomic mass units. So let's talk more about that. Or you can say this is its weight in grams. If you have a big collection of them, the big collection is called a mole. And that was kind of Avogadro's thinking. And so that's where we're going to go. And so let me point out that we're going to look at that number three different ways. And so right now I'm discussing looking at that number as its nucleon number. And so in a little bit, let's talk about it in terms of its atomic weight number and the two interpretations of that. But I will just focus my attention right now on its atomic, I mean its nucleon number, not on its more commonly referred to its atomic weight number. But I wanted you to see here how the number then would come out to be something that is not exactly a 
a four. And you would also then see how the scientist would measure it if you think of it more as a weight. You just make a spoonful of them, you put it on the scale, and you measure it, its weight. But it actually comes from the number of, of, of nucleons. And so that's why you can interpret it as its uh, nucleon uh, number. So I want to emphasize that even though the nucleon number is not an exact integer, note that if I ever grab one atom by itself, you will never have something like 4.1 nucleons in the nucleus. You either have 4 or you have 5. The only reason we have a, or even 3, uh, but you have 4 or 5 or 3, you have an integer. You never have 4.1 nucleons in the nucleus. Now, again, if you take a big test tube full of it and you measure it, you can talk about its average. And that's what I'm trying to show here. Well, one more thing here with the structure of atoms, and we better uh, move on here. But maybe the most interesting one, and then maybe at this point also easy to understand, what would happen if, and so let me get rid of that extra neutron. So let me go back to helium, and I'll call it the neutral helium. What would happen if I moved removed a, a proton. What would I have there? And I hope what you're getting out of this is you would not have helium anymore, right? Didn't I say over and over, and I'll say it again, it's the number of protons that determine the element. I no longer have two. So I have a whole different element. What do I have? Well, I guess I got to come over to the periodic table. Let me get my pointer. But since I took one away, I only have one proton now. And so if I come over to here and look at the number one, that's hydrogen. And so I would say I now have hydrogen. And so if I come over here to write this on the board, I would put a capital H. And so by removing one proton, I have now actually changed it from helium to hydrogen. Now, maybe we should look a little closer at the hydrogen up here. The hydrogen says that this number right here, which we call the atomic number, is number one. That means it has one proton. Okay, so that's what I just said. But if you come down here and look at what I'm calling its nucleon number, which is also its atomic weight, its closest integer is 1. You can see now it's a little more than 1, but I'm going to call it 1 here for a second. And so that means you have only one nucleon, which is that one proton. So that means it doesn't have any neutrons in it. That's why I didn't want to start with that one. That one just doesn't have enough structure. If it doesn't have any neutrons in it, you guys wouldn't have been able to see its neutrons. So I, I started with the helium instead of the simplest one. But the simplest one, the hydrogen, is so simple it just has one proton and no neutrons. But what I have over here, then, when I took away this one proton and have one proton left, I still have the two neutrons in it. So I don't have the normal hydrogen. I have an isotope of hydrogen. And in fact, to label it, as we did back here with the helium, I should put a 3 right there. Because I have three nucleons. And I don't have the normal stuff. Now, for that matter, when I took away the proton, I still have the two electrons there. So in other words, I have an extra electron compared to the normal and the neutra, neutral hydrogen. So I guess I should also put a negative here. So not only do I have an isotope, I have an ion. And so I have a negative charged hydrogen atom with three nucleons in the center. And one thing we'll talk about near the end here is nature may not like that. And so I may have it, but nature may say, you know what, 
uh, let's fall apart or change things. And, and this one, this one would. Uh, it would actually lose an electron. Uh, it would eventually also lose a neutron. And you would be left with this, which would be also helium. I mean, a hydrogen, because it's got one proton. It would be neutral, so I wouldn't call it an ion. But it does have a neutron in it, and so it would be two nucleons. And so that's how I would uh, label it. Uh, we call this deuterium. So sometimes people take an extra step and give it a D, since there is no deuterium up there. But uh, again, that was probably unnecessary to, to go there. All right. Well, I hope, again, what you, you got here out of this beginning part of this chapter, which again, remember, these next four chapters or three chapters are the structure of matter. This is the structure of an atom. And so I would say at this point, I, I think I've got across to you, it's my little rag, uh, that what does an atom look like? And then, of course, how would I use that periodic table? And so when it comes to the structure of matter, I've done a subset. I've done the structure of the atom. You could now tell me what an atom of gold would look like and what an atom of aluminum would look like. And so I've done the atom and things smaller, what we like to call the subatomic particles. Let's go the other direction. What would happen if I made something bigger than the atom? Well, what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean is, what if I took a couple of atoms and then started hooking them together. And so instead of looking at things smaller than the atom, let's look at things bigger than the atom. And so why don't I start with hydrogen? All right, so we've been talking about hydrogen. Let me use the, the normal hydrogen. So again, I'll look at this periodic table, the normal hydrogen. Uh, if I wanted to draw it, I won't draw the subatomic stuff, but it would have one proton, no neutrons, and one electron. What if I had another hydrogen next to it? Now, I could just hook those together, but let me make it a little more interesting and something common to you. Uh, why don't I grab oxygen? Now, oxygen is number eight. And so, looking at that, uh, I would say oxygen then would have eight protons in the center. The number of nucleons is closest to 16. So, that means it would have eight neutrons as well as the eight protons. And the neutral one would have eight electrons orbiting around. But again, let me not draw all of that. Let me just put an O for oxygen. Now, for reasons that are probably best left to your chemistry course, um, just because we don't have so much time, and of course we're kind of touching a little bit here on chemistry, uh, what likes to happen, and for those of you who've had some chemistry know, that because where oxygen is in this periodic table, let me grab my pointer again, oxygen is two columns away from the edge. So two columns away from the edge, one, two. Uh, what that means is oxygen essentially likes to hook up twice. It's like it has two arms. It reaches out and says, I want to grab something here and I want to grab something here. But hydrogen is one away from the edge. And so it likes to hook just one time. It's like it has one arm reaching out. So I put two of them up here and try to draw this picture, which is the hooking together of three different atoms, two hydrogens and one oxygen. And so we like to then label this as two H's and one O. H2O. 
Uh, some like to label it this way, H-O-H. It kind of more gives what, what is really happening. But I like the H2O. It's a little easier, I think, uh, on the eyes, but uh, not as useful as this one, really, for chemistry. But this H2O is one that I think is common to you, and we would call this then water. And once we start hooking a bunch of atoms together, we will call this then a molecule. And a, so a molecule is two or more atoms connected together. And then, of course, that's the whole study of chemistry. Why would it form this way? Why does oxygen like to do the two? Why does hydrogen like to do the one? Why does the fluorine like one? Why does the nitrogen like to hook up three times and all of those good questions, which, which are great questions, but I'm going to, again, just say that's, that's not our approach today in class. Well, uh, that's going to be covered for in your chemistry, and so hopefully you'll, you'll do a lot of chemistry as well as a lot of physics and uh, put those together. Maybe you'll go into material science. And in fact, let me encourage you uh, to go into material science. Uh, boy, if you like material science, the future is wide open. That's a big career field in the, in the future. High demands. Uh, if you want you know, job security and lots of money, and material science is the, the way to go. And so a nice crossbreed between chemistry and, and, and physics. It's a, a, a great future. Uh, but that being said, I'm just trying to work on these words. I told you this first part had a lot of words in them. And so I just want you to understand what a molecule is. So a molecule is something bigger than an atom. A, a molecule is something where we have a bunch of atoms and we, and we hook them uh, together. In this case, there's three of them. There could be four or five or six or like a giant DNA uh, molecule. Well, we, it's so big you can uh, see it under a microscope. So, you know, we call those macro molecules. They're huge. There's, well, I don't even know how many are in a DNA. But there's a lot. I was going to say millions, but I think it might be in the way of billions of, uh, of uh, atoms hooked to hooked together there to make those big, big molecules. Anyways, we'll keep it simple. We'll just hook three. And so this is what water is. But what I wanted to point out here is when I come over here and I look at this periodic table. So let me come back to this periodic table. When you first look at it and you start counting the protons, you put one and then you put two and then you put three and then you put four and then you put five and then you put six and then you put seven and you keep putting them together and in this chart it's kind of hard to see this but you see if you could imagine cutting this chart and spreading it out this group down here what we call the F section should go right into here so you kind of imagine that spread out but you can see as you count, and I get to this last row, 87, 88, 89, 90, 91, 92. And by this time we get so many protons that nature just doesn't allow us to put more together. Or nature doesn't like more together is probably a better way of saying it. This 93, 94, 95, these are all what we call man-made atoms. Uh, these are what we won't find in, in nature. Uh, we have to make them. And of course a lot of these are you know, done at UC Berkeley and the whole Lawrence Livermore lab and so that's why you find things like Berkelium and Californium and Americanism and uh, all of these. Uh, oh, there's Lawrence, Lawrence Labs, Lauren, however you pronounce that, Lawrenceinium. And so they've got um, these human names for uh, this California that we live in here. But I do want to point out then the natural elements here. There are 92. And at first thought you might say, okay, so we can have 92 different types of material. But it's better than that. Because we have 92 different elements which again come from three things, protons, neutrons, and electrons. But then those 92 could also be rearranged 
And what you get, which we call water, is totally different than just hydrogen by itself and totally different than oxygen by itself. I mean, if I had a bottle or a test tube of hydrogen, it would be a gas in this room. And if I had a bottle or a test tube of oxygen, it would be a gas. But when I put the oxygen and the hydrogen together, I get something that's very different. It's a clear liquid. I probably don't need to show you water, but I brought it out nonetheless. Here is a beaker with about 400 milliliters of water in it. And if I can get to a microscopic scale and I could look at these little things, I would see an oxygen kind of reaching out with two hands, grabbing a hydrogen on each side. So there's two hydrogen and one oxygen in here. But again, I want to point out the properties of that oxygen are very, very different than those individual elements. And so that's the world we live in. You could actually then in kind of a weird way say what is different about a human compared to a table? <laughs> and the really the answer is how those protons, neutrons, and electrons are arranged. Because when they're arranged differently you get something like carbon. Now me and this table which has some wood in it, uh, that table has a lot of carbon in it. I have a lot of carbon in it. But my carbon is hooked a lot different than that carbon. And I have other things like hydrogen and oxygen and this has other things besides. And so what we end up with is probably close to, maybe not really an infinite, but a really large number of different materials. And so when we take a bunch of atoms and hook them together and get a molecule that molecule or a bunch of those uh, molecules are referred to as a a compound here and so maybe I should even put the word here compound and so water is a compound because a water is taking enough molecules of water, H2O, until it gets big enough that I can see it, touch it, and fill it with my eyes and my hands. And so a bunch of molecules together make my compound. Whereas starting with the atoms, and you put a bunch of atoms together so it's big enough for you to touch and fill, you get the elements. And so a slight subtlety on these words, uh, which is why besides having water, which I will now call a compound, I have brought something like this. Here is a box of aluminum. And we call it aluminum. Of course, it's big enough to fill and see and hold. But it's made out of billions and billions of aluminum atoms. So this is an element. Where this is a compound because it is made up of billions and billions and billions of molecules. And so I don't know if the, the physics really is different between those two. But those are the words we, we like to use. And so a bunch of atoms make an element and a bunch of molecules make a compound. And so that's kind of that subtlety. So definitely water is a compound. Um, I'll show you another one here. Uh, another element would be, let me pick this one up. Uh, this happens to be lead. This is an element. Uh, if I look here in the periodic table, um, I can see number 82. Um, again, it's after the Latin, so it's PB. But PB, number 82, this is lead. And so billions and billions of lead atoms hooked together is what this block is. And so this is an element. So these two are elements because they're made out of a bunch of, of atoms. But again, the water is a compound because I, I cannot look up in this periodic table and find a water atom. There is no such thing as a water atom. There is a water molecule. Now water molecule is made up of the hydrogen and the oxygen atoms. So 
You hook the atoms together to make a molecule. A bunch of those make your compound. So let me show you another compound, not again that exciting, but before I just, class here, I just grabbed a petri dish here and poured a bunch of salt in it. I just took the salt, salt shaker and poured it in here. And so this is kind of this white powder, but this is a compound. I, I could not look at this periodic table and say, hey, where is a salt atom? There is no such thing as a salt atom. There is a molecule. And in this case, it's a sodium chloride salt molecule. And so if I put it over here, I would take, say, a sodium and a chlorine. And again, not needed for this class, but if you know a little bit about chemistry, and we'll come back to the periodic table, the chlorine is one away from this last column and for that matter the sodium is one away from the edge so they both like to make one connection they both are like reaching out with one hand and so that's why the sodium and chloride go one to one and so we like to represent that by drawing a little line and say okay the sodium reaches out with one hand and the chlorine reaches out with one hand and they hooked together. And so we have sodium chloride. So this is the sodium chloride molecule and if you have a bunch of those you'll get enough that you can see and taste and feel and so that is the compound. And so I have the sodium chloride compound right here. We just call it table salt. But again let me show, point out something real important here. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen sodium by itself, well, probably not. It's very reactive. It's not very uh, safe <laughs> to have sodium by itself. But sodium by itself looks a lot like <laughs> this shiny piece of metal. And chlorine by itself, which again, maybe you haven't uh, seen, or maybe if you uh, uh, have a pool, Maybe you've seen some of the chlorine gases as you try to pour in your liquid uh, chlorine and some of it escapes, but it's a, it's a gas. It's kind of a brown gas if you like history in uh, World War I. Uh, the chlorine gas was a, a, a good one that the, uh, uh, the Germans would use in World War I. They would fight fire canisters of chlorine gas and it would be this brown gas. It's very reactive too and so it's very unsafe by itself. You don't, certainly don't want to breathe it. It would, you know, blister your lungs and if you get enough of it, it you couldn't breathe. And then that was the, the whole idea of using gas to, uh, warfare in, in World War I. Um, but what I want to point out then is if you haven't seen sodium or chlorine by itself, um, this may not mean much to you. Maybe you can Google that and uh, you're uh, since you're studying this from home and see what they look like. But I want to point out once they hook together, we get a white colored, harmless solid. And so the sodium and the chlorine, when hooked together, is very, very different than the individual pieces. And so just like water is very different from hydrogen and oxygen by itself, Salt, sodium chloride, often called table salt, is very different than just the sodium and the chlorine by itself. And that's why this begins as the structure of matter. We have almost an endless possibility of different materials that we can make and build. And we are probably, right now in history, just beginning to discover how many other things we as humans can make. And that's why I said material science is going to be, an ama it already is, but it's going to be an amazing field with lots and lots of great new discoveries. And it's, it's going to get really scientifically quite complicated. And, uh, you know, the pay is going to be great and the need and the demand is going to be great. So, you know, if you're still out there fishing for a career, uh, material science is, you know, one of my top picks for the, for the future. I was like, wow. Well, what a great opportunity. Um, so that being said, I hope I'm getting my, my point across here, is this is what I would call the structure of material that is bigger than the other. 
And so now we've gone both directions. We started with the atom and we looked what is smaller than the atom. Now we're looking at what is bigger than the atoms. There's a lot more in this chapter. Let's see how we doing on time. Oh good, we got lots of, of, of time here. Uh, but there's a couple of things that um, I should continue to add. Uh, let me then draw Um, yeah, I'll do this and maybe I'll just put hydrogen I mean helium again and so I have the nucleus and I have the outside but I want to also keep this general for all the atoms not just the individual atoms and one of the questions that is worth asking is what is the size of the atom? Question mark. Well, again, going back to my analogy, like humans, I, I wouldn't say all humans are the same height. But I can give you an approximate rough number of what an adult human's height is. There are no humans taller than three meters. Uh, there's only a few that are more than two meters. You look at them going crazy. What? Uh, two meters would be what? Six, about six eight. So and there are people bigger than six eight. But not many. <laughs> All right. Um, on the other hand, with very few exceptions, I don't think there's many adult humans under a meter. All right. So I think it's fair to say that in, in rough numbers, humans really are mostly between one and two meters. And if you're willing to say, well, give me a bigger room here, I'll say, okay, one to three meters. But even that's pretty small. And nobody's going to say humans five meters or ten meters or a hundred meters or a thousand meters. And I want to say the same thing about these atoms. Are they all exactly the same size? No. But are they all roughly the same size? Surprisingly, yes. Even though they've got a lot more neutrons and nucleons in them. Remember, those are packed in the center. It's the outside where the electrons are that really decide how big they are. And so know this, that the size of an atom is about 10 to the minus 10 meters. Now, some of them, like the smallest one, are 1 times 10 to the negative 10. And so that's like hydrogen. And then the bigger ones, like uranium, are about, I'll call it a 6 times 10 to the minus 10 meters. And so I want to emphasize, is there variations? Yes. But nobody would say an atom is one meter big. Nobody would say an atom is one centimeter big. In fact, there is not a single atom that doesn't have a times 10 to the minus 10 behind it. That is the rough size of an atom. Well, here's why that could be useful. What if I did this? What if I came over here and I grab this piece of aluminum and I say, how many aluminum atoms are on this square surface right here? Now, I will tell you, that the square on this face is two centimeters by two centimeters. Well, since I'm asking how many are there, you're, you're probably going, well, I, I need to know their size, right? Yeah, right, and that's what I'm trying to say. I know their size. It's something times 10 to the minus 10. Now, I think aluminum might be closer to three times 10 to the minus 10, but why don't I just do this for a moment? Why don't I kind of imagine, here's my face of aluminum. So here's my aluminum. 
And if I have an atom right here on this face, I might say, okay, here is my aluminum atom. Uh, here is a second one. Here is a third one. Here is a fourth one. Here is a fifth one. Here is a sixth one. Here is a seventh one. Here is an eighth one. Ninth. Now, there would be a lot across here. And, and that's kind of my question. How many would I fit in here? So remember, this is two centimeters long. And the size of one atom is about 10 to the minus 10. And I suppose this will take us back to fourth grade. You learned an important math property called division. When do you use division? Well, you use division when you're asking a question, how many of these little things fit into a big thing, right? If, if you had like the number 10, if you had uh, a piece of wood that was 10 feet long, and then you had another piece of wood that was 2 feet long, and you, maybe you had a bunch of them, and you said, okay, how many of these 2 foot long pieces of wood could I fit within this 10-foot piece. And, and hopefully what you did back in fourth grade was division. You said, okay, I would take the big thing, 10 feet, and then ask how many times does the little one go into the big one? And so you would come up with the number five, and of course the feet would cancel off. And you'd say, okay, I get five of these little pieces of wood within the big piece of wood. And that's really what I'm, I'm asking you here. I am asking, how many of these little atoms can I fit in the big two centimeters that is the length of the face of this piece of aluminum block? All right, so the big thing is two centimeters. The little thing is times 10 to the minus two meters.